So we are very glad to get this um, very august panel of experts on this particular situation. Uh, we have Dr. William Jackson, with my right. Um, he's from the Center for Disease Control. Uh, he's also a Navy, excuse me, he's also a captain in the US Navy, and uh, really, and a scientist, for that matter, on Ebola. So he's gonna come in with um, global and national perspectives on this particular situation. Then I have Dr. Perio. Uh, he is the executive director of uh, Citrus County Medical Center. Uh, he's going to come in with our local perspectives on Ebola. What do we expect? How prepared are we? Uh, what are some of the misconceptions and conceptions of Ebola here in our ca local counties? Then I have Lynn Maltese. She's a nurse in our program here. She will come in from the nursing perspective. The nurses, they're always on the front line with Ebola. So we have um, a wonderful selection of experts here on different dimensions of Ebola. Please don't make their presentations, and we hope you'll be able to ask questions. Uh, please give them a hand. Dr. Jackson, please. Thank you. Good morning. Um, I uh, very much want to thank you, uh, the institution, as well as each one of you, for participating in this video. Um, Ebola is perhaps the sine qua non of the concept of thinking globally and acting globally. In the interest of full disclosure, however, I uh, should point out that while I have served with Naval Coastal Warfare. My commission was through the U.S. Public Health Service, and my wings came from serving as a search and rescue flight surgeon for the U.S. Coast Guard. So it's a complicated uh, uh, uniform history, and it confuses everyone, not least of which sometimes myself. <laughs> that said, uh, I'm going to shift this about just to, to accommodate the audiovisual requirements, and I can see my plus. So, the Ebola outbreak of 2014 has certainly refocused uh, public health attention as well as the general public's attention on the need for public health and its importance in day-to-day -day life. Uh, this is the largest Ebola outbreak uh, in history and has required perhaps the, the uh, greatest international coordinated response uh, and while the countries affected uh, probably have uh, concerns as to the speed of the response. Even the President of Liberia said, we may have come late, but we came large. To date, uh, there have been uh, almost 10,000 deaths from Ebola, um, a total of almost 25,000 cases over uh, a project which, uh, which have had Even more. Uh, with uh, approximately almost two thirds of which have had some degree of laboratory confirmation. The main uh, countries outlined in this slide are the principal countries still affected, being Guinea, Liberia, and Sierra Leone. As you probably well know, other countries were affected but have either surpassed. Uh, two to three um, intervals of potential transmission with no new cases. So Nigeria, Mali, uh, and other neighboring countries are no longer under active surveillance. Uh, however, these uh, these frontline states, as they might be to which they might be referred, uh, are st still finding new cases. And even recently, uh, the uh, protection staff of one of the executives of one country. Uh, ultimately died of Ebola, and we now have another foreign leader under self-imposed quarantine. For, if you wish to start, if you need to start a timeline, you can start with the official summary as of September of last year, where the case definitions were established and projections were made. Uh, 
but the key point at, this, at, uh, in, at the end of last fiscal year was, given the doubling rates that were being seen in Sierra Leone, you were going to rapidly have an overwhelming situation with uh, infection spreading throughout the continent. While Ebola would be a challenge in any continent, in any public setting, it's particularly true in West Africa because of the infrastructure challenges and the shortages they had in certain forms of skilled healthcare and skilled workers. When we talk about infrastructure, one of the fundamental issues in dealing with any outbreak is the ability to know what your data sources are, to be able to share those data sources, and to be able to make them reliable. And this was particularly challenging in any uh, vicinity where the infrastructure has not been previously set to facilitate and make those processes efficient. Uh, West Africa being no different than many other areas of the world, Southeast Asia, South Asia, uh, even some parts of Eastern Europe. So in August of last year, the World Health Organization officially declared Ebola an international health emergency. Uh, this permits and facilitates certain processes that can uh, make uh, more efficient the, process, the logistical needs to respond to such an outbreak. And the uh, public health emergencies uh, actions allow for uh, the sharing of information under a facilitated manner between nations as well as organizations. To respond to West Africa, we had to continue, uh, uh, the, all organizations that participated had to deal with the fact that you're talking about non-fixed borders and somewhat porous, uh, high degree of mobility. What we're looking at here is the uh, uh, border between Guinea and Sierra Leone, and this is a relatively shallow river. You see the dugout in the lower left-hand corner. Trade has gone through with the indigenous residents of this area for millennia, uh, with or without uh, previous colonial intervention, and they continue to they continue to work that trade as part of their day-to-day -day life. However, that said, if you're not feeling that bad, but you're trapped, just like anyone else who has a mild infection or even a recurrent malaria, you're going to get your work done, and that might mean crossing that river. In which case, you've just moved, you've just changed what has been a local incident along the bank that's closest to us on the screen to an international incident as you cross to the bank across the river. And this goes to the geographic breadth that rapidly uh, assumed, was rapidly assumed by this outbreak. Another important element of this is the degree of scientific literacy. And I dare say this could be a problem in almost any country, uh, including, if not, not including this one. But that said, there was uh, a lot of fear and superstition. Um, incomplete information leads to erroneous assumptions, erroneous conclusions. We can see this occurring in the affected countries. Like any new disease, for those of you who might be too young to remember, this was very much true in this country, as when HIV was first reported in the mid-80s. Uh, there's a rapid stigma, distrust of outsiders. You begin to get clannishness between infected and affected communities versus non-affected and non-infected communities. And then there have been previous wars in these areas that have both broken down uh, some of the earlier discussed elements of infrastructure, as well as led to various forms of uh, intra- regional distrust. So if you're going to respond to any outbreak, you're going to have to respond to the infected individuals and the exposed individuals. And there are several elements in, in trying to respond to both of those. For the infected, you will have uh, specific elements of patient care that are more um, rigorous with the case of Ebola. Not necessarily more rigorous than any, because we have many of these same processes where we're dealing with certain types of hospital-acquired infections that can be transmitted from group to group, or even other forms of viral infection that uh, are frequently matters of public health concern. But by addressing these in patient care, you 
additionally address other elements in interrupting the chains of transmission. And then specifically with Ebola, while it may have zoonotic aspects, once it's crossed over into human populations, you must focus on stopping human to human transmission. And that is where you get into the fundamental bootstrap, shoe leather forms of public health activity. Case identification, contact tracing, and infection control. And then finally, you must educate the community because you will only be able to accomplish the previous three uh, goals if you are able to get buy-in from the local communities, local community leaders, and from the general public so that they can help you do the job at hand. This can also require a certain amount of linguistic literacy because this country, like many, have multiple uh, languages that are important in day-to-day -day transactions. And you, cannot, you can't just use, as in this country, you cannot simply use the official language of government to make sure you get your point across. You must be in a language that is most likely to get your message across to the communities that are affected. In this case, it includes uh, English, French, as well as uh, I'm going to say Portuguese. Because while the wars may be porous between the adjacent countries, because of today's modern means of transportation, the border is essentially worldwide. You're probably well aware of the fact that Nigeria got its first case because uh, an actual country leader left feeling slightly off uh, from one country, landed in Nigeria, and rapidly became ill with relatively rapid transmission to both uh, associates as well as care providers because they weren't, it wasn't clear what they were dealing with. That same degree of uh, rapid uh, means of transport means that all of us have some degree of risk and some of that showed up in Dallas, Texas at the end of September. Um, again, because there was, there were challenges and clearly, cleanly identifying the travel risks, the infection risks, the uh, healthcare worker risks of this individual. There were satellite cases and secondary cases that turned up in October as the individuals who were in close association with the victim ultimately became infected themselves. That said, I, wanted, I wish to emphasize that with regards to the U.S., no individual who has contracted or who has been inoculated or infection within the borders of the U.S has died, but everyone has survived. So while it is dangerous, it is manageable. But you have to remain aware, you have to cooperate, and you have to respond quickly. So um, for those of you who may not necessarily have been following this on a day-to-day -day basis, or who are somewhat new to these, this part of microbiology, Ebola is a rare disease. Uh, it goes, it, it can be undetected for decades at a time, and uh, previously, uh, the last major outbreak was actually in the 70s. There may have been very, very rare Ebola-like syndromes, but they, weren't, they either were not proven or there was not subsequent transmission. Um, it is one of the family of viral, uh, uh There are a number of what are called hemorrhagic fevers that are in this uh, family, including Marburg, uh, Lhasa. However, they can present similarly, but ultimately have slightly different outcomes depending on which uh, of those families you're, uh, you're, uh, on which you're focused. Uh, Ebola itself has shown up in a number of countries. It was first identified as a uh, problem within the Congo. Um, it was associated with a significant degree of political unrest at that time, so a great deal still needed to be learned. However, uh, most of the subsequent cases after its initial description from the Congo were found in Uganda. Its appearance in West Africa is actually relatively new. But that said, you can now see that this is a, uh, a viral disease that probably can affect anything along the tropical belt, which is not uncommon uh, if you think about the other viral hemorrhagic fevers such as dengue uh, and, uh, and its uh, associated uh, zoonotic infections. Again, uh, one sees the 
reason for its uh, name of filovirate uh, or its filamentous. Uh, for those of you who have seen other pictures of other viruses, um, they might be round and spiky, uh, or very much like DDs, say norovirus, or even bullet shaped like the uh, like uh, rabies, where it looks like something ought to be that should be fired from a weapon. Uh, here are a list of some of the other, I won't go through all of them, and I'll deal with the resting issue. If someone's really interested in that, it's complicated and it has to do with uh, animal shipments. But suffice to say that for any of you who are going to necessarily deal with zoos in the future, it's one of the reasons why your veterinarian is your best friend. And I'll talk more about the death rates from Ebola later because I, at this point in my career, I'm not doing any one number uh, completely captures the risk of Ebola. Suffice it to say that if you uh, get it in the middle of nowhere and you have no support, you will probably die. However, if there are interventions that can take place that can rapidly decrease that mortality rate from 100%. And one of the reasons why it does seem to be so uh, ethereal is that it probably has a multiplicity of reservoirs. Um, certainly, if in doubt, as one of those of you who might have seen the movie, <laughs> A recent movie uh, with uh, with Wahlberg and and, uh, and, uh, and others. You, if in doubt, blame the bat. Uh, but uh, in this case, there are probably other animals as well, uh, including uh, some classic, what would be classically uh, hunted animals for meat and certain types of lowland deer, and and probably some non-human primates. And um, for those of you who might be for those of you who might be hunters, particularly this one is exactly this is very it's the West African equivalent of what those people who like going into the mountains to hunt elk for. Uh, so this is a standard form of meat. Uh, it is uh, it has been part of the diet for millennia, and uh, and in point of fact, once you start trying to uh, take it from being prey to an actual dinner product. Uh, that is where family members can become exposed, or the hunter themselves, and ultimately start with your K0 and subsequent transmission. Whether the virus cycles between these different animals as well as humans in any particular pattern has yet to be delineated. So therefore you see arrows all over the place because it's really not quite clear. But that being said, there does the virus does seem to be able to appear in each of these, and then probably as a matter of, uh, of subsistence living, get transmitted zoonotically to humans. Ebola must come in contact with either a mucous membrane or breaking skin, for the most part. I'm not going to say that with absolute terms, but in most cases, uh, that, that seems to have been the case, with very, very rare exceptions. That said, mucous membranes are, for those of you who have not had anatomy, are everywhere. They involve your eyes, your nose, your lips. Um, and because there is a certain finite survivability of the virus outside of a human host, even if you, even as, even if you think you are away from it and you have an inoculation somewhere else on you, you may still be able to self-inoculate. So that makes trying to make, keep yourself away of away from contaminated objects or contaminated material, extremely challenging. And this can involve every single human fluid you can think of. If I've left one out of there, I'm, I'm welcome to ask, have you bring it up, I'll make sure it gets added to the next slide. But as far as, I think I've covered all the missionable and unmissionable human fluids that we all excrete. Uh, in addition to contaminated objects, uh, humans and animals, um, it's even possible that once a person is infected, they can, uh, they can perhaps even transmit it vertically. And actually, Ebola and pregnancy is probably a fatal combination in almost any event. However, I want to emphasize that this is not, while it is a zoonotic infection, it is not like malaria or dengue. This is not one that is spread from among human populations through the bite of any particular insect. So uh, for those of you who have looked at how disease progresses, uh, you can focus on uh, this day one as being the, uh, the initial inoculation period. And then in relatively 
short order, although it can take up to 14 days when it begins to become, like it begins to become symptomatic, and the onset of symptoms also tends to concur with the onset of transmissibility. So those individuals, for the most part, who are not symptomatic are people who are probably either not infected or, or certainly not transmissible. It does not seem, unlike, say, influenza, or more importantly, say, measles, there is not a catarrhal phase where people aren't showing signs of the active disease where they can actually transmit it to other humans. And then if you manage to survive the first week, you probably, more than half of those people will survive the second week. And those who get past the second week typically go on to survive and become fully immune. That's an important point, because that means if you, know, if you have a population where you have infected individuals, once you have survivors of, within that population, you now have potential caretakers and assistance for any satellite cases, because these people are immune and will not be reinfected. So why is it hard to, uh, why might it be hard to identify these individuals early on? Well, the bottom line is Ebola early, in its first day or two, feels like, like a bad cold, influenza, or for this part of the country, it feels like a, maybe a mild recurrence of malaria. And perhaps none of you here have ever had malaria. I have had to take care of malaria victims. But uh, if, you have, if, you have, if you become a chronic malaria sufferer, it's just a periodic period of having a very mild case of the flu, which some people can even work through, or worst case, you know, you take a day off from work and you stay in bed and you're generally well enough in a day or so to resume. It, it's only that with Ebola, it goes from that to proceeding through to its more uh, severe symptoms. So you go from, say, the myalgias and headache of malaria to, uh, well, a little bit of vomit diarrhea. Okay, maybe we've now got uh, a bat, so a little bit of food poisoning. Then the abdominal pain becomes a bit more severe than you would expect for any of those, and then the bleeding starts. And at that point, uh, one, you're also you're at greater risk yourself, but you now have a much higher viral load, and you've probably been able to transmit it to anybody who's been in contact with you uh, through some of the earlier periods. And again, while uh, most people seem to show signs of symptoms within uh, two to three days or a week, of uh, being initially inoculated. The longest uh, that has ever been observed, and this was in an earlier outbreak from that uh, slide I showed you from the Congo experience, where up to 21 days between the identified inoculation, or potential inoculation, and the actual uh, appearance of disease. And then that 21 day period is what uh, is the science that drives most of the policy decisions as to how people are followed and monitored if they think they, if we think they have been exposed and then they subsequently travel outside of an endemic area. Prevention itself is primarily a non-pharmaceutical, a form of non-pharmaceutical intervention. Uh, I'm certain you've heard in the news about various other therapies and various vaccines that are under trial, but as of this date, there is no FDA-approved vaccine and it will take time to establish the safety and efficacy of any of the current uh, combinations that are under study. So when you're talking about non-pharmaceutical forms of intervention, you need to focus on those things that have been common to public health practice for centuries. So primarily careful hygiene, preferably with soap and water. If, soap and water are if, good, soap, if good water is unavailable, or soap is unavailable, then the alcohol-based forms of hand sanitizer are quite effective, unlike norovirus, which we sometimes hear about with cruise ships, which can be resistant to alcohol-based sanitizers. Uh, the phylloviridae are extremely sensitive, much more like influenza in that regard. But again, every fluid that the human body can excrete or secrete uh, is a source of considerable uh, viral inoculum that needs to be avoided. And then, of course, because almost nothing dries out completely without reasonably rigorous action, all of the items that have come in contact with the victim are also sources of inoculation. And I, w I think uh, to go through the social funeral rituals of the individual um, frontline states is probably beyond the scope of this discussion at this time. Uh, suffice it to say that uh, burial rituals differ from country to country and 
and are not always as vigorously regulated as they are in, in the United States with, uh, without the same degree of mortuary technical expertise. And so the funeral and burial rituals can often be a means of transmission. This is a group that I have an ultimate confidence that at least some of you will probably be involved in this in some way. If you do decide to volunteer and if you are selected to uh, assist in the response, um, there are some things you need to consider or at least try to keep in mind as you, move, as you travel through the areas that have been affected. Um, it is always, and I speak from some personal experience, it is always desirable to get as close to the people you're trying to assist as possible. And I, I have certainly dined with them, but, uh, and I have dined on local fare. However, and this is one case where you should not, you, while you may be in some place like Rome, you should not be doing as the Romans do, and you should be avoiding contact with any kind of meat products that might come from bats. And by the way, fruit bat is supposed to be very tasty. Um, the other bats, maybe not so much. Fruit bat, really good. Um, but avoid contact with bats or a product of meat or, or any other form of bush meat. Because the bottom line, you're not going to know where it came from. And, you know, and chances are, your host probably doesn't know where it came from. They're just trying to keep you comfortable. If you do wind up feeling like you might have been exposed or that you might be at an increased risk, uh, the U.S. embassies and consulates in all of these areas have become on alert and they will be able to provide help. They will definitely be able to provide advice and perhaps even more assistance if you feel that you're at some degree of increased risk. But in any event, if you uh, feel like you've gotten the flu, if you even think you might have malaria and you're in an area where Ebola is a concern, and at this point, really talking about the three countries I put on the board earlier, Sierra Leone, Guinea, and Liberia, if you're in one of those things, you feel like you have the flu, get seen. Don't wait. If, especially if, you, if, if, if you've gone through there, if you're assisting while you're there, or even after you've come back within the first month of your return. And then, of course, I would behoove you, if you do wind up going to those areas and you do come back, try to minimize your contact. I mean, it's not the time to go to a uh, uh, rock concert, mosh pit. Uh, at least, you know, give it a month before you do anything like that when you come back. There is uh, specific guidance in the CDC regarding these things if you want uh, to get more specific details. <coughs> but most importantly, if you are worried or if you're going to be working in a healthcare setting, there's additional guidance with regards to uh, having laboratory specimens. This was an issue that came up with HIV, for those of you who may be a little too young to remember. Uh, and, and I bring that up only to remind you that this has been an issue that we faced before. Bloodborne infections have been in, intrinsic to healthcare for some decades now. And whether we're talking about hepatitis, HIV, or Ebola, there are standard practices that will protect uh, the laboratory workers as well as the healthcare facility at large. And the guidance has been printed, uh, and uh, this involves both handling the specimen as well as transporting the specimen if your local uh, medical treatment facility doesn't feel capable. And as long as they go through, as long as they uh, adhere to those guidance uh, procedures, the risks are nil or negligible that additional transmission will take place in that regard. However, if you are called to actually collect specimens, there are some special procedures that you must take before you interact with victims and that you must maintain as you try to get specimens from a victim to a, to a facility that can help you uh, confirm uh, the diagnosis that you suspect. Uh, the, the most important among these is the personal protective equipment that is recommended in these cases. Uh, that has evolved somewhat over time. Um, but if you had to summarize it, you want to have protective equipment that essentially covers any skin exposed surface. And that's the simplest way to think about it. You can, there are various forms of this. And as I said, it's, it has evolved. And there's, there are some people who have, uh, who may beg to differ on some of the men that you want. But if you can remember that you don't know when's the last time you brushed against a brick building and maybe scraped your skin a little bit, or you maybe uh, 
scratch yourself against the sharp edge of a plastic countertop. That said, since you can't be absolutely certain what the condition of your skin, every square millimeter of skin is on you, the safest procedure is to cover all skin surfaces. And, and obviously, all mucous membranes in there. And from that, you get the uh, so-called bunny suit. With, uh, it, in, they tend to look like a very expanded set of dishwashing gloves, uh, partly out of cost and partly to make sure that the yellow surfaces are moisture resistant. You, want, you want the moisture repelled. You don't want to be absorbing moisture through the protective gear. But the apron doubles up. Some people will primarily work with the apron, but it's best to have a long sleeve as well as a cowl and obviously goggles and masks so that this individual has no skin surface that's going to be splashed on. And again, unless you're fortunate enough to have a laboratory that can do the actual molecular diagnostics on site, you're going to have to send the, send the uh, specimen out. Uh, in some cases, the specimen will actually wind up flying by aircraft. So a series of nested containment systems so that no matter, I mean, even in a plane crash, and I have seen this happen as a flight suit, uh, some of that, some of the, some of the uh, some of this packaging may get damaged, but I have never seen the actual vial sh uh, shatter all over the place. And you can usually tell when you look at the first box whether the whole box just needs to go to the incinerator. So that when you, if you follow these instructions that are you know, worked out by the, what's a uh, group now known as IATA, uh, an acronym from the first letter of it. Uh, that, and this is, these uh, regulations have already been in place for, for decades now with the air transport of hepatitis and uh, HIV samples. So this is a well-practiced, very familiar procedure for transport associations. And, uh, and then the only other, there, you, I would also check though, because sometimes with what are called high bio-risk agents, there can be additional regulatory, not necessarily safety, but regulatory elements. So make sure you don't run afoul of those. Again, as I said earlier, the uh, virus is generally not picked up by any molecular test that we've developed to date until people become symptomatic. And uh, the primary means is through nucleic acid application uh, methodology of various kinds. PCR being the most common among them, but uh, but whether you're using uh, whether you're using an excretory fluid or blood, you want to follow all of the Precautions that we've just outlined. Prevention and treatment are, uh, in both cases, fairly traditional. While there are some potential treatments, perhaps just over the horizon, none of them are fully FDA approved. Uh, and while um, it's possible under some circumstances to get access to some of them. Um, you'll probably need to find an infectious disease specialist somewhere before you'll be able to make those arrangements. So in the interim, if, uh, if you are asked for advice regarding what types of care these individuals get, it's primarily supportive. Uh, and you've seen this to a very great extent with some of the uh, particularly European cases, but even in this country where there has not been the availability of any of the experimental. I mean, if you can get to the individual early enough and you can replace the fluids and you can allow, by enough time, for the body to mount its immune response, people have survived this. And that's also been true uh, more, certainly more recently within the frontline states. Why? That's why there are more and more survivors. If we go back to one of those, my first slide, you'll notice not everyone died. And even later, you see that the slides now go from uh, perhaps what you heard of 90% when you first heard of the outbreak, now we think more along the lines of at least half of people are survival. And it's quite possible that much more than half can be survived if you can get them to healthcare time. You may have remembered that uh, you saw something that looked like a truck as an ambulance uh, in one of my first slides. One of the problems that you have with the infrastructure in the frontline states is the most common form of ambulance service is a taxi. And if you're going to be calling a taxi for the ill, then 
the people who assist the victim and to the taxi, the taxi driver who may assist the victim. Alan Trapp, you've now multiplied quite rapidly the number of people who, uh, have, who have been potentially exposed. And in point of fact, that was the uh, narrative behind the Texas case before the victim returned from West Africa to the United States. This form, these forms of supportive care can ultimately lead to a recovery. Uh, we have seen it in West Africa, we have seen it here, we've seen it in Europe. So I, while I think of this as a, I continue, and will always think of Ebola as an extremely serious disease, an extremely serious infectious disease, I speak of it as a survivable infectious disease. And if there is one message I would like you to carry away from this as you begin to act uh, locally, as you begin to become the frontline advocates, public health advocates, in your community's preparations, hopefully not community responses, this is a survivable disease. So, like any good epidemiologist, what is the case definition? Um, well, there we have, for the purposes of follow-up, we now have at least three categories of what one can call cases. The first being a uh, person under, under in, a person's under investigation, or a person under interest, uh, or a person of interest, probable case, <coughs> confirmed case. Um, so, a person becomes of public health interest or becomes under investigation uh, if they have some form of an epidemiolog epidemiologic risk. So, have they been in the area? Have they been in contact? and they have significant symptoms primarily, the most important of which being fever. Uh, so they, if they have all three of those um, within 21 days of your having some interaction with them, they can become a person under, uh, under interest. Obviously the healthcare workers and the responders to the area are principal among these groups, but you can get more questionable cases, oil workers, uh, rubber workers, other types of international forms of commerce can wind up having uh, exposure and risks of varying degrees. If a person falls in that category of being of interest or under investigation, uh, you then want to try to sort out whether they're a low risk exposure, like that rubber worker or oil worker I've talked about who maybe had some internet and community contact but did not have, it did not engage in any activity that you can readily identify as undoubtedly re resulting in some form of human-to-human -human contact with moisture exposure. And then if they're low or high risk, you can try to confirm, make that a confirmed case through the laboratory diagnostics we briefly outlined earlier. So the high risk, highest risk individuals in this category primarily are healthcare workers. They are going to be close to the, there's no way you can be a healthcare worker dealing with the bullet victims and not come in proximity. Ergo, the uh, personal protective equipment that we outlined earlier. But uh, keep in mind, there are other people besides healthcare workers that can still result in risk. Uh, many societies, based on income distribution, have a number of people who are involved in the cleanup and the assistance of individuals who might subsequently become ill. So, uh, home homemakers, maids of um, uh, the general uh, support staff of one even large institution can result in, can uh, wind up performing activities that will put them in contact with clothing, <laughs> bedding, even potentially needles and what we would consider biohazards. And so individuals who wind up in those areas, if you can identify activities that might have put them into that position, you may have to change their risk category from lower to higher. And then, as I said, if, if one is in a foreign country, it, it's very hard to stay in there for any length of time without trying to reach out to your host community. And uh, if, uh, if you're, uh, gust if you're uh, gustatory and palate, palate adventures uh, get too adventurous, you certainly can uh, put yourself at some risk for exposure to the virus. The healthcare workers uh, who are in that area well, if you, again, if you do wind up in any such of those teams, I 
feel really very confident at this point that there will be numerous briefs, numerous prep. Uh, they've almost all reached out. The coordination between them now is much better. But that being said, if you have any questions about what they should be covering as they brief you for uh, volunteering, uh, it, it should cover elements of what should be the best protective clothing, what are going to be the procedures hopefully written down in checklist form in terms of uh, infection control and sterilization. Uh, hopefully there will be very specific outlined um, guidance regarding how the, uh, what isolation procedures will take place and then uh, notification procedures as well as uh, gowning and degowning procedures to minimize any contact with contaminated materials or victims themselves. If you are going to be working with healthcare providers, um, hopefully you and they will uh, re repeatedly review what will be the uh, symptom checklist that each of you will go through and what symptoms you'll most focus on. Um, because of the nonspecific nature of most of the living symptoms, um, uh, there will almost always be a focus on unexplained bleeding. Uh, but keep in mind, even that can be tricky. If a person is pregnant and they're bleeding, that is not uncommon. Women will spot quite frequently. It's always a high risk uh, concern sign for pregnancy, but it does occur. And that might not necessarily be, your first thought may not necessarily be a bolo when it comes to a case like such as that. But always, if you have a suspicion that there is some epidemiological link to a previous case and you have any of the symptoms that are of concern, that you follow whatever the previously outlined isolation procedures and immediately establish the infection control procedures that will minimize the risks of transmission. If you uh, need additional guidance or you wish to cross-check what you're being given across what are now the international and national precautions, um, we can certainly provide the uh, URLs, but uh, if you go to cdc.gov, the Ebola link is quite prominently dis uh, presented on the CDC page and it will rapidly take you to the rest of these forms of written guidance, which you can download for your, on your own personal flash drive or print out to carry uh, in case you're worried about battery power. Mm. Uh, one other thing is that if you do have a victim and you do think there's going to be some delay in getting them to uh, more uh, extensive healthcare or infection control procedures, try to put them in a place where they can have their own private bathroom, where they can have their own space, and where you can minimize contact with other either family members or other uh, fellow, for instance, travelers. Uh, that's, that applies most commonly to planes, but it can occur to homes if there's some question or uh, if there's some, um, if there's gonna be a time delay between suspicion and diagnosis. Again, uh, if you are volunteering, I am very confident that whatever organization you wind up working with will have many of these procedures in place or modification of those procedures. But that being said, uh, there are other safety training courses if you feel that the organization um, hasn't given as much attention as you'd like, you can go to the CDC website and, uh, or to Medicine Sans Frontier or World Health Organization for additional training opportunities, links, and guidance. And these safety training courses will cover much of what we just discussed here, but in much greater detail, and with some degree of repetition, and most importantly, will give you practical exercises for you to begin to exercise the new knowledge that you will have acquired. Um, the, uh, the ones that I've had that training through DOD at its facility in Fort Sam Houston, but there's a new facility out in Aniston that uh, will work, walk you through um, these varying levels of training um, and specifically with the PPE, um, uh, contaminated object contact, and the management, handling, and disposal. Uh, if you want, we certainly after the discussion, I'll be more than happy to uh, go into more detail regarding any of these items. Uh, suffice it to say, though, that bleach becomes the most common, the most frequent common denominator in almost all these procedures. Okay. 
And the only reason why there's this, you can see me reiterating and emphasizing the training element, is that repetition uh, to the point where you're no longer thinking about the steps you have to go through when downing and dropping is probably the most important element in avoiding the, uh, or minimizing the risk of that variable one slip up that changes you from a person who's gotten through a particular deployment without any problems to a person who now becomes uh, the next media uh, sensation. Especially if you've been to bowling alleys. I think this. There is also, if, if you are worried about someone who has recently traveled through those areas and you wish to have evaluated, there is a uh, flowchart as to, uh, to summarize the checklist that I've just walked through. Um, these also appear at each of the international ports of entry, particularly on the Atlantic coast, but I think at this point they're now on both coasts. So by working with uh, airport personnel and uh, your local health care agency, you can walk through these to determine if all the appropriate steps have been taken in the evaluation and to ultimately assign the appropriate level of risk for a particular traveler that may have become under interest to you either in a volunteer or in a professional. You can find both the flowchart as well as the checklist, again, at cdc.gov and its Ebola site. Uh, feel free to print this out, post it if you are in, or ask, ask uh, your supervisors where it might be often posted if you feel that uh, additional warning, notification, or reminders are needed in your particular setting. And again, if you have any additional questions, please consult with your local health department. They have been working with this since August and September. And while they have other things to do, I can assure you, they have all become quite well versed in all these matters. Uh, again, this interruption or the containment of Ebola is primarily an infection control practice. Yes, there are victim response elements. Yes, there are uh, other there are elements of quarantine and isolation, but fundamentally. This is the practice of infection control, it's not dissimilar to some of the antibiotic resistant organisms you sometimes see in other settings, not too dissimilar to uh, the types of infections one sees with transitory or migratory forms of labor. And so doing, the key element is try to recognize that you're dealing with potential syndrome early and then try to take steps to minimize patient exposure and protect the individuals that are involved in the care of that individual, be they family or be they professionals. Uh, there's always some concern about what level of cleaning is required once one has identified a victim. There is, there are very few answers that are pat. As I said a little bit earlier, bleach is your best friend in these situations, but not every, not every fabric object can easily be contained with bleach. So if something is porous and absorbable, don't feel that it's readily cleanable. In other words, it doesn't have a, a moisture resistant surface or a moisture repellent surface. It's probably an object that needs to be bagged in some way and then disposed of appropriately. Other than that, the, uh, there is additional environmental uh, cleaning um, guidance uh, through the CDC and the EPA. And if you're going to be performing such cleaning procedures, Personal protective equipment is just as important there as it is as if you're taking care of a victim. I won't go into patient care radio at this time, but suffice to say that uh, there are infection. Hopefully, there will be an infection control officer any place any place that you might work where there is going to be patient care for such victims. They will be very well versed on these, uh, and the main idea is. The items that are going to be involved in the care of a victim are not items that will be generally accessible to anyone else. So you can think of it as one of the layers of isolation that one employs once one's identified a victim and started to care for that victim. I will mention that uh, West Africa now has the highest level of public health warning that CDC will generate. Uh, that's just for the frontline states of Liberia, Guinea, and Sierra Leone. Uh, the others have all been downgraded 
because while they may have had victims in the past, they were able to employ all of the measures we've just talked about, uh, isolate the cases, eliminate the probability of secondary and satellite transmission, and now they're no longer considered uh, at risk. So that if you have a traveler now coming from South Africa, they are not at risk. And I would even extend that now to anyone coming from Nigeria, which is probably the most important uh, West African state with regards to international travel to the U.S. Mm -hmm. If you have reasons, for whatever reason, to travel to any of those areas, we do ask that you work with your local uh, public health county or community public health agency as you return so that a, a procedures, a mutually agreeable procedures can be made so that you can be monitored at, at some level to which all are comfortable for the 21 days following your return. The notes here are notes that while we emphasize them, really bold, these are really things you should be doing anytime you travel internationally. Um, for those of you who haven't, suffice to say that um, even the na even the nascent uh, indigenous microbes of a given area are going to be different than the microbes you've been exposed to here. And your immune system may not be quite as ready for them. So that any place you go, whether uh, no matter how adventurous or safe you may be, you're going to be at some adventurous risk. It comes with travel. But they're all manageable risks if you follow some of these standard practices in terms of uh, personal hygiene and, and self-monitoring. So uh, while we're, this slide is back up here for Ebola, I would, if you, if you take a bit of time to just kind of semi-memorize some of the steps here, these are steps that you should be taking any time you travel abroad. Because it's, to, it, and some would even argue, any time you travel to different regions of the US, it's a large cut. Um, even the E. coli differ from region to region within the US, let alone across the international borders. So, uh, Consider this is something that if you intend to be a traveler, these are just practices you should try to ingrain into your own travel uh, habits and activities. But for Ebola, I will reiterate that once you have, from the day you leave, the day you exit from whatever port, that country, you start kind of watching yourself for 21 days and trying to minimize your contact with others during that period if you actually travel to West Africa. Since different states have had different responses to try to protect their citizenry, uh, we've, the CDC has come up with various forms of conditional release and control movements to try to organize the monitoring of that 21 day period. If you have a specific interest in these types of uh, movement control and this interim interval form of isolation, I would urge you to contact your local health department and they can walk you through how they are implementing these. But uh, for those of you who are going to be working outside of the state of Florida, you may find them vastly different than the ones that are being practiced in this Florida. Florida is probably one of the more assertive states in terms of trying to uh, implement this. Uh, once you move beyond the state level, uh, the federal uh, response to being led by the state of disease control, and it works primarily in support of host nations that are trying to establish their own procedures uh, or subnational procedures through emergency operation centers or EOCs and through some of the specific non-patient care uh, support activities with logistics, analytics, and communication and education. Uh, for those of you who are interested and and work out a means of volunteering, uh, you may well wind up working with CDC staff in any of the frontline states in order to, to assist with some of the out, previously outlined support activities. And uh, indeed, there are even, uh, as you've probably already heard, Ebola uh, treatment units. Uh, these have been, some of them have actually been built by NGOs, but all of those have been built either by the Department of Defense or other uh, forms of volunteer agency, and there are 
disaster assistance response teams that actually have patient care units, which is where some of the training I previously outlined takes place. So the U.S. response, U.S. support of the international response as coordinated through the World Health Organization can involve every level of practice from individual patient care to community education. And I think there's even, there was for a while even a mortuary assistance team to try to assist with the proper handling of, of victims afterwards. Because keep in mind that an Ebola victim can still remain dangerous well after that. But again, we do, uh, all U.S. efforts, be they uh, NGO, federal, or international, uh, are all at the behest of a host nation. And so keep in mind that you are a guest, and you need to be uh, mindful and aware and uh, cognizant of uh, host nation requirements, be they social, legal, or customary, and when you are in that area. So if any of you do volunteer, try to become as aware as you can of what the requirements of your host nation might be. Time's up? All right. Um, I'll simply mention that the only U.S. federal agencies that might be further uh, of interest to you are Customs Border Protection for returning as well as the individual airlines and emergency medical units at the individual airports or ports of entry with, with which you may serve. So um, I'm here to talk today a little bit about the implications um, for the nursing profession. How many of you are in nursing here? Good, good. So I'm um, going to talk really uh, not so much just to you, but about what it, does it mean for our profession? What is it that, um, what is our role? So um, when I talk about Ebola, again, um, the origins doctor, Jackson, talked about that as far as, of course, we know it originated in West Africa. Um, it is not new, 1976 was the first, first case. Um, but from West Africa to the rest of the world, that's really kind of what I want to talk about a little bit today. It is not just confined to West Africa. We cannot um, think that it's only going to stay in West Africa. We know um, for a fact because it has been here in the U.S. And just again, this map looks familiar. Dr. Jackson had that on his presentation. This just shows you um, a little bit of where uh, the concentration was, is in West Africa from, um, I've got from the year 2000 to 2014 up there. And in the U.S., you can see what uh, hospitals were these at. Do Texas Health Presbyterian, where was that? What was that the site of? The guy who died. The guy who died, yes. That's where that first victim was, the guy who died. And the second one, anybody know that one? Bellevue, where that was? That's the one where the doctor came back. Very good. And it's in what city? New York. New York. Okay. So with that in mind, how many cases in the U.S.? Two cases. No, there's been more than that. Four. Four. There's been four cases. How many deaths? Two. The one. Okay. So we look at that Ebola in the U.S. Four cases, one death. So really, my question is, should we really be that worried? Yes, we should be that worried. Um, only if we want to be that ostrich with our head in the sand. Um, you know, uh, the thing is, is that we know that this can definitely be an issue. Do you remember, how many of you remember SARS? The SARS incident. Okay. SARS was um, also a disease that, um, you know, I don't know if you recall in Toronto. You know, Toronto, very industrialized, very modern, lots of technology. They couldn't stop that. So yes, this can be uh, definitely can be an issue here in the U.S., and we need to be thinking about that. So what do we need to consider um, as nursing? Coming from a nursing background, um, of course, what do nurses do? What are we really good at? Helping, helping. But what do we what do we tell people? How do we tell people? What do we get across? What are we really good at? Information. Information, which is in the form of care. Education. We are educators. We are patient educators, we are public educators. This is what we do. Um, when I talk about education, when it comes to nursing, as far as from a nursing perspective, I'm not only talking about educating other healthcare providers, but I'm also talking about education of the public, okay? Nurses work in public health. We um, have a huge, huge influence on that um, venue. 
So again, who is the best position for getting the word, word out? You. Nurses. Nurses. Nurses are in the best position. These are just some uh, photos of some nurses. Um, a couple, uh, you know, you can see in public health settings. I mean, we are out in the public. We are on the front line. And when I say the front line, I don't just mean, you know, yes, we go to places like West Africa. We are in the front line there. But we're also on the front line here at home as well. Um, you know, we, are, we have been in war. We uh, work during uh, pandemics or epidemics. We also, uh, disasters. Um, any, you know, you remember Katrina. Who's on the front lines? Nurses. Nurses. You know, healthcare workers, but a lot of nurses were on the front line. You know what, we care regardless of the risk, okay? We talk about Ebola, and you know, it's frightening. We, we know, um, you know, it's a dreaded disease, and you know, it seems so easy to catch, but when you think about it, is it really that easy to catch? Yeah. What was that? Not with proper precautions. Not with proper precautions, because it is a blood-borne disease, correct? It cannot be spread through the air, it cannot be, you can't get it from a mosquito. So, you know, the thing is, is that we, um, we have expertise in working with conta containing contagious disease with proper training, with proper education, as Dr. Jackson alluded to. So what is our vital role? Our vital role as nurses, and again, I come from a standpoint where I worked in travel health. Before I started working in travel health, I thought, what in the heck do we need somebody like that for? You know, very interesting. I came from a small town in northern Minnesota, 15,000 people. Uh, we had a university there, uh, a lot of people traveled. I was really surprised how many people traveled to these godforsaken places I've never ever heard of, and that they needed to have education on travel. So my advice to people is, nurses um, are vital as travel educators. Um, I really, really counsel people or tell people that it's very important that if you do plan on traveling, if you are a mission worker, if you are going to do healthcare um, uh, in a foreign country, you really should see a travel health professional. Most travel health professionals will use, of course, the guidance of the CDC. Um, I also uh, uh, was a member of the International Society of Travel Medicine, and we had a, um, a company that we used called Travex that we got a lot of our information with for people that travel abroad. Any country you can think of, they had information on. So um, keeping, um, it, the thing is too, we wanna make sure uh, that we talk to people who are traveling to these hot spots, um, you know, and also to seek guidance post-trip. Again, which Dr. Jackson had talked about that. Keeping up to date on the most recent infection control guidelines, um, you know, I think that is really important. I have students now at ORMC and um, we talk about, if we see patients that have MRSA, anybody know what MRSA is? It's the methicillin resistant staph aureus. So you know what? You have to gown and glove. You have to do all that. Let's just say that the gown and gloves, the gowning that we do for MRSA would not cut it for Ebola. <laughs> so we need to be prepared to uh, be protected from that. And I think it's really important that once we um, have that education, you know, we take the fear out of caring for people. The Institute of Medicine Development has a development, they're, they're developing a national strategy, of course, on um, infection control for Ebola. Also, um, part of our job is to prepare those uh, people who are going to work as volunteers. Again, that's really important that we educate those people. Um, really important, again, taking the fear. How many of you would be afraid to go take care of somebody with Ebola right now? You know, it's natural. I mean, it would be, um, honestly, I'd be a little bit fearful. But I think with the proper education and knowing, again, how to put on my equipment, take off my equipment, um, would really take the fear out of that. I actually was gonna talk a little bit about from fruit bats to chocolate syrup. Anybody um, know the reference to chocolate syrup in the Ebola? Um, there was a study, or they had done a study as far as uh, take, putting on protective equipment and taking it off. And they used chocolate syrup as to, to designate Ebola. That was Ebola. So the person with their protective gear had, all, they got chocolate syrup all over their protective gear and when they had to take off their equipment, if they had chocolate syrup in any area of their body, that's, they contaminated themselves. So, you know, it's a good practice that would be a good education tool for people that are, you know, going to go to these areas, you know, really um, practicing, take, putting on and taking off that equipment is very important. 
So what are local healthcare facilities doing to prepare for Ebola? As I said, I have students at ORMC. I just had a conversation with one of the staff nurses. And I said, so, you know, what are you doing? Um, do you think that in, they're doing anything? Yes. Yes, they are. they are. How many of you work in a healthcare facility right now? Okay, so you could probably tell me more than anyone what you're doing. I know at the ORMC here uh, in Ocala, uh, they have designated rooms. There's a screening process. Um, in fact, I just went to a walk-in clinic on Saturday and they had a screening process. There's a big board right up front that says, have you been, um, do you have a fever? Are you vomiting? Have you been to West Africa in three months, within the last three months? And then they, you know, so there, they are, there are some preparations that they're, they're doing. Um, following the CDC guidelines, and these are the questions that the CDC is recommending that um, healthcare providers ask their patients when they come in. Um, so, um, you know, we are, we are doing something. I want to talk a little bit about the myths. So how many of you think there are myths out there about Ebola? <coughs> oh, there's lots of myths out there. Um, the thing is that Ebola won't spread in the rich countries. And, you know, also being a nurse, um, I'm very uh, social justice aware, okay? As nurses, we are very socially, we're, we're, um, we care about social justice, and when we talk about this, Ebola won't spread in rich countries, what do you think? Hygiene, you know, the thing is that, yep, we have the greatest technology, we have high technology, but that's a myth. Ebola can't spread in rich countries. Do you know why? It just, it just takes one. It just takes one. You know, we are an arrogant people. You know, we are an arrogant people. You know, I remember, I used to show my students the program, um, it was a movie called, and the band played on it, it was about the first HIV, a lot of you are too young to remember that. But in the early 80s when HIV came here, it was a gay person's, gay man's disease. Nobody paid any attention to it. There was a gentleman, I can't remember his name, with the CDC, who knew that this was an issue. He was pursuing it, pursuing it, and he was poo-pooed because, you know, it's not gonna happen to anybody because that's just a gay man's disease. It wasn't until a rich socialite contracted the disease through a blood transfusion that, oh, we have a real problem. So. The thing is, is that it can spread in rich countries and we do need to be prepared. Because of 9-11, we're ready. Are we ready? No. All right, no, we're not ready. We have a long ways to go. That's why panels like this are so important. We need to get involved as a community. We need to get involved. We need to be aware of what's going on um, in, our, in our world. Ebola could go airborne. Well, how many of you think that could happen? It can't. It cannot go airborne, all right? It's just the virus is not made that, that way. A ban on travel will contain the disease. No. No, it will not. And a vaccine is just around the corner. No. You know, I tell you, I've been, as I said, I worked in travel medicine. The big thing when I was in travel medicine was dengue fever. Oh, there's just a vaccine for dengue fever. It's coming around the corner. Well, there's four strains of dengue fever, like there's many strains of Ebola. Vaccine is not around the corner. It, can anybody say clinical trials? Years and years, it's not around the corner. So we have to be, we, we have to be aware of that. Okay, so myth number six, those US nurses who contracted Ebola were lax. This is where I really get a little frustrated because it's like, let's throw the nurses under the bus, um, which is so not fair. The thing is, um, Dr. Allen, or Associate Professor Alan Chang from Monash University did an article, did a, he did a study, actually those nurses were very hyper-cautious they had on three layers of protective equipment. They were very protected, so they thought. But the issue is, in removing that garb, the chances of contamination increase the more layers you have. So what that tells us is that it's very important that we learn how to put on our protective equipment, the protective equipment, not three layers of it, learn how to put it on properly, learn how to take it off properly. So no, those nurses were not lax in their precautions. Having more equipment means better protection. Well, I just said, no, it does not. And then um, personal protective equipment must be complicated in order to protect. Okay, I know when you look at the protective equipment that we need to use for Ebola, oh my gosh, it looks so complicated. But in reality, is it really that complicated? No. Again, what's going to help people to get prepared for that? Education, education on that. Let's take the fear out of that. And finally, the one thing that I want to talk about, the last thing, you know, as far as with nursing, like I said, we are on the front lines. We are here to educate. That's what we're here to do. 
This last slide, um, another important cons consideration, um, you know, this kind of typical U.S. guy here, you know, he's uh, smoking, got his beer, and his big old hamburger, and his french fries. Um, but Ebola, I'm so scared of Ebola. Uh, chances are he's going to die of his heart disease or his um, uh, alcohol consumption way before he will Ebola. So I think the real key is here that, you know what, we need to prevent hysteria. Um, we need to be educated and we need to prevent hysteria. So I thank you for your time. Uh, and uh, leave that now to Dr. Yes,